Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's just under a year since I stood up and made a speech in response to the 2020 budget in a, in a chamber packed to the gunnels uh, with MPs. And the notion of delivering a budget speech from my front room was absolutely unthinkable, along with many things we've adapted to over the past year. And in this past year, we've seen economic shocks as well as this personal and social ones. Phrases we rarely, if ever, used before are now in constant use. Face coverings, social distancing, extended households and furlough. And I appreciate that the government had to move quickly to provide support in a rapidly changing and deadly pandemic. Choices were constrained by the circumstances and large sums of money were rapidly moved to protect businesses from the worst economic crash any of us, we hope, are likely to see in our lifetimes. And there is great hope in the horizon with the advancement of the vaccinations, but we can't tell how long this crisis will last. The Chancellor and the Prime Minister have form in telling the public that it will all be over by the summer by the autumn, by Christmas, by spring. So we need to call canny with what lies ahead. As I've said consistently, arbitrary cut-off dates in the support schemes are deeply unhelpful. The last cut-off for furlough planned for last year resulted in people losing their jobs as employers just couldn't manage the additional costs. Six months on, and the only thing which has changed for businesses is an additional burden of debt and bills, with VAT um, deferrals uh, going, coming back online soon. And businesses' income hasn't increased, and adding to their employers' costs is not risk-free. We in the SNP benches support an extension to the furlough scheme for as long as it is ne necessary in all countries of the UK. We also support the extension to the self-employment income support scheme, as announced by the Chancellor, but it does not go nearly far enough, still leaving millions of people locked out of COVID support. The cliff edge in the fifth safe scheme for those uh, above or beneath the 30% drop in turnover seems incredibly unfair and incredibly steep. The Chancellor said yesterday he will do whatever it takes to rescue our economy. He said that a year ago too, and it's called comfort to those who have yet to see a penny piece in support from his government. The excluded have been mentioned over a thousand times in Parliament by the APPG gaps in support in reports from the Treasury and the Bayes Select Committees. Solutions have been offered to this government and it's unacceptable that the Chancellor continues to ignore these cries for help. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Chancellor made much of the Office of Budget Responsibilities forecasts of a quicker than anticipated recovery. But it struck me that the key considerations of the OBR forecast shouldn't necessarily be the forecasted numbers themselves, but the uncertainty around these numbers. And it's this uncertainty that the Chancellor needs to respond to. The OBR have been clear in the unrealistic nature of the government's spending plans. The Treasury envisaged only a 2% increase in spending after five years, which was already planned uh, pre-pandemic, and this does not really capture the potential legacy costs of COVID for our public services. The UK government's planning a further cuts of £3 billion to departmental budgets on top of the £12 billion cuts announced in uh, November. And the OBR describes the government's ability to meet these cuts while dealing with the pandemic as a significant source of uncertainty. I cannot stress enough how much I feel that the Chancellor cutting his way out of this crisis is the wrong way to go. The Chancellor said that once we're on the way to recovery, we'll need to begin fixing the public finances. But I really do object to this characterisation of the issue. Public finances are not something that get broken and need to be fixed. Public finances should meet the needs of our population, not the other way around. All countries around the world have stretched every sinew to save lives in this pandemic. And as we see from the US and our European neighbours, the Chancellor ought to use the powers he has open to him to stimulate growth and to provide an investment-led recovery. The Scottish Government have an, outlined an ambitious five-year infrastructure plan with a, a particular focus on affordable housing. They're managing to do this even with a 5% cut to their capital budget. But the Chancellor had an opportunity to reverse this and refused to do so yesterday. We've called on the Chancellor to provide a 98 billion fiscal stimulus to kickstart this investment-led recovery, with investment focused on creating jobs, boosting incomes and a green recovery. Instead, it looks like the Tories are returning to form and pursuing a contractionary policy against all better judgment. Mr Deputy Speaker, this approach did not help us recover quickly from the 2008 recession, and it certainly won't help us now. The risks of a long-term uh, return to austerity are clear. We face stagnant productivity, years of lost growth, and public services have been cut to the bone. There is no doubt that without the previous 10 years of austerity, our public services would have been in a much better position to deal with the impact of the pandemic that we faced. The OBR's analysis of this budget explicitly cites higher infection rates, hospitalisations and deaths in the UK as a driver of economic inactivity. And their figures are stark. The UK's GDP fell 9.9%, the worst in the G7. 
One in five UK residents contracted coronavirus. One in 150 were hospitalised. One in 550 died. The worst, the fourth highest mortality rate in the world. And under this government, the, U the pandemic has hit the UK's economy harder than other major economies. And yet, the Chancellor is continuing to underfund our precious NHS, which is expected to return to its pre-COVID spending plans after March 2022. Mr Deputy Speaker, we in the SNP are calling for the Chancellor to look to Scotland for inspiration. The Chancellor should match the Scottish Government's £500 thank you payment to the NHS. He should prioritise a, pri a pay rise for health and care staff increasing NHS funding to Scottish levels per head, which would deliver an extra £35 billion for the NHS in England and an extra £4 billion for NHS Scotland and Barnet Consequentials. We need to shockproof our NHS for the future and make sure that those who have served on the front line of this pandemic know how much we value their contribution. Throughout this pandemic, Mr Deputy Speaker, the voluntary sector has been instrumental to ensuring our communities are resilient enough to weather the many emerging challenges whether it's food security, tackling rough sleeping, combating loneliness, improving digital connectivity or finding safe places for those experiencing domestic abuse. Increasing gift aid temporarily, temporarily from 20 to 25 percent, making it easier to claim for small donations, would be a real boost to the sector. And I ask the government to consider this for the upcoming finance bill. A choice has been made in this budget not to place the burden of debt on uh, who, those who can afford it the most. The Treasury has said this is not the time for new fiscal rules, but has instead announced the intention to start a consultation at the end of the month, so they've kicked the can further down the road. I think the Chancellor's done this for two reasons. Firstly, by doing this outside of the budget process, he'll avoid the fiscal analysis and proper scrutiny that a budget would face. And secondly, he is giving high earners enough time to shift their savings into ISAs or other tax-free schemes. We're already seeing financial advice cropping up to, for people to avoid the coming tax hikes. So the Chancellor's message of fairness rings hollow if he's only buying time to protect himself from scrutiny and to give high earners a head start to hoard their wealth. And instead, we've seen a, a stealth tax rise in ordinary earners. The personal allowance at which people start paying income tax will rise from its current 12,500 to 12,570 uh, from April the 6th, but they will then be frozen until 2026 rather than rising with inflation. This is a tax rise in real terms. The OBRC is, it puts 1.3 million people into the taxation system and putting the hardest hit onto households who earn the least. Mr Deputy Speaker, I want the Chancellor to bring forward measures to tackle child poverty and boost household incomes. The Red Book at page 14 recognises the economic impact of restrictions has not been felt equally. Staff in the hardest hit, largely consumer facing sectors such as hospitality are more likely to be young, female, from an ethnic minority and lower paid. But this UK government does nothing in this budget to tackle the problem they have identified. Conditionality and universal credit is also forcing people out to work and putting their health at risk unnecessarily. The government could establish a real, not a pretendy, living wage at the rate of the real living wage uh, foundation rate. They could end no recourse to public funds. They could increase statutory sick pay. They can match the Scottish child payment across the UK. They could ditch the, the Tory public sector pay freeze. They could make the £20 uplift to universal credit permanent. The Chancellor could extend support to those on legacy benefits, including many people who are disabled and carers who have completely been forgotten by the Tories. He could scrap the benefit cap and remove the two-child limit and the pernicious rape clause, which forces so many families into poverty and increasing numbers of women into making heartbreaking choices like terminating a third pregnancy. What a cruel, wicked government this is. And as things stand, we're facing a six-month cut-off to this uplift to universal credit, where it will coincide with the end of furlough, the end of mortgage payment holidays, and a likely peak in unemployment. The Chancellor has accepted that this is a lifeline for families through the pandemic, so why would he then plan to rip it away at the worst possible time? And if nothing else, I expected that the Chancellor would understand the importance of the social security system as a safety net, which would allow for a flexible labour market. If he wants people to be able to retrain and equip themselves to face a post-pandemic world, he needs to provide the support to enable this. We're seeing the Tories shy away from redistributive policies during the worst recession we're likely to see in our lifetimes. History is repeating itself yet again as we in Scotland watch with horror a Tory government that we didn't vote for, again trying to balance the books on the backs of those who can afford it the least. And Mr Deputy Speaker, it's often the case that people most affected by austerity policies are women. During the pandemic, women have shouldered the disproportionate burden of caring duties. They are more likely to switch to part-time work and they are more likely to struggle in the scramble for jobs when things start to open back up again. They're more likely to already have been impacted by the welfare reform before the pandemic began. 
And I had hoped to see some commitment from the Chancellor on the disproportionate economic impact that women have felt over the last year, but not even as much as a patronising pat on the head for mums in his speech yesterday. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's undeniable that our labour market is heavily segregated by gender, and some of the sectors that are dominated by women have been most affected by COVID restrictions. The childcare sector, for example, employs mostly women and it is vital for ensuring that many more women can go back to work. It has been struck by lockdown and restrictions to the extent that the IFS has questioned the long-term sustainability of the sector as demand changes and unemployment increases uh, after the fur furlough. The hair and beauty industry is also a large employer of women and is an industry heavily supported by women's money. I've met with salons in my constituency and I'm sure that, that many others in this house will also have done the same. Hundreds of jobs for women are on the line if no support is provided from this government. Chopping the VAT to this sector as demanded by the Save Our Salons campaign would be a real boost to a sector where it is feared that many will just not survive this crisis. Mr Deputy Speaker, my colleagues and I have asked the Treasury to look at VAT reductions for specific sectors or areas in the past. We've called for and welcomed the VAT cut for hospitality and tourism and would have preferred to see the 5% rate to um, rate cut to last longer so that this sector could really see the benefit of it, particularly for the music and events sector, who haven't been able to sell many tickets this past year. The AT cuts for repairs to buildings would also help to end the scourge of derelict buildings in my constituency and many others, and encourage investing in our built environment rather than demolishing and rebuilding. It could also be used to boost energy investment and energy efficiency measures, contributing to our net zero ambitions. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Tories have long claimed all sorts of things will be possible after Brexit, but now we've left the EU, budgets are coming and going with no regard to these issues. Not only have Scotland's industry suffered after Brexit, but we aren't even seeing the promised tax, targeted tax cuts where we could uh, see a real benefit in our economy. And I'm sure I wasn't the only one to notice that this year's budget made scant mention of Brexit, which will be of little consolation to Scotland's shellfish industries and countless others affected by delays to exports and charges applied to imports. The OBR didn't miss this, so, and they say we now expect the temporary near-term disruption to EU-UK goods trade to reduce GDP by 0.5% in the first quarter of this year. This reflects that both exports appear to have been hit harder than imports, and that the trade disruption will affect UK supply chains. And they don't rule out further disruption either, as well as a long-run loss of productivity of 4%. The SNP have called on the Chancellor to mitigate some of the damage done by Boris's botched deal by providing a Brexit compensation package for Scotland, in line with the EU's 1.5 uh, Euro bil billion euros for Ireland. And Scotland's communities stand to be battered further by some of the impacts of Brexit. We've seen the end of EU structural funding and the threat of a shared prosperity fund controlled from Whitehall, bypassing our democratically elected Scottish Parliament. Mad cap money spinning schemes like the Boris Bridge through the Beaufort State Munitions Dump, rather than schemes our communities actually want and need, with local jobs focused on a green and sustainable recovery. Mr Deputy Speaker, Scotland's ambitions to grow our tax base and maintain long-term funding for public services are massively undermined by the hostile environment to immigration. Brexit and the pandemic have conspired to stop people moving to Scotland. The Tories are actively and brutally cutting migration to satisfy their own arbitrary targets, and Scotland's economy will suffer for it. Mr Deputy Speaker, I was absolutely furious to hear the Chancellor talk about attracting in highly skilled IT professionals, as outlined on page 62 of the Red Book, because he seems to forget that there are already many people here uh, who his colleague, the Home Secretary, has tied to the port for the heinous practice of making a legitimate uh, amendment to their tax returns. Highly qualified migrants, many of whom work in IT already, who made their home here, who were then treated abysmally by this government. So many won't want to come, having heard how their friends and relatives have been treated, bankrupted and made to feel like criminals. The 3225 scandal is still affecting people today, including my constituents, and I would urge them to listen to organisations like the Migrants' Rights Networks and fix this in injustice once and for all. Mr Deputy Speaker, on a whole host of issues, the economic illiteracy of this UK Tory government knows no bounds. Further polling out this morning shows that 71% of people in Scotland believe we would fare better out with the UK, with 53% already backing independence. We face a choice of two futures in Scotland, and I hope that soon we will have the opportunity to take matters into our own hands. Thank you.